Uh, I want to touch on, I've been throwing around the word consciousness. Um, most of us would agree in our vernacular that consciousness is what? You know, awareness, wakefulness, um, the state of being conscious, awake. If you were to ask scientists what consciousness is, they have no idea. We have no idea what consciousness actually is. Um, one of my dear friends is an anesthesiologist. She puts people to sleep all day. She wakes them up all day. Not a clue what's actually happening. And she's not alone. That's, that's the field of science. It's admitted consciousness is a mystery. Where does it live? Is it in our brain? Where is it? So, okay, the universe is energy. What does that have to do with consciousness? Uh, unlike the traditional scientific model in which phenomena are observed from a distance, we are part of this energy exchange. We cannot remove ourselves and our consciousness from it. It's impossible. So we tend to think of science as objective, and the scientist is here, and that which is being studied is here and there is no relationship between the two. In the realm of consciousness, completely impossible. Because we're always conscious. We're always conscious. Even in deep sleep, you think about it, there's awareness, right? How did, how did you know you slept well last night? You were asleep. How did you know you didn't sleep well if you didn't fully wake up? We all know, was I restless? Was I out? There is something that is still awake, that we're not conscious of. And that is one aspect of consciousness that is um, our very humble, humble attempt to research that is uh, what's unfolding now on our planet. Very exciting. Uh, the universe is an unimaginably complex field of interconnection, sometimes called the quantum field or the zero point field. And consciousness is a part of it, which means that we are a part of it. Uh, I don't know if you can get better than having an Einstein quote in a talk like this. A human being is part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical illusion of his consciousness. We really tend to think our thoughts are right here, right? It's kind of in this um, separate body-mind. University of Oregon physicist, Dr. Amrit Goswami, consciousness, not matter, is the ground of all existence. And consciousness creates the physical world. Here's that open mind. Here's that being from a state of discovery in the talk tonight, right? Very relaxed, very open. Who knows? I love the name of his book. Again, this is dated 1993. However, I don't know that the world has been ready <laughs> for this kind of message until, the, until now. The Self-Aware Universe. The Self-Aware Universe. How can consciousness create the physical world? It sounds like a pipe dream, like some sort of sci-fi. And we're going to do a little demonstration, believe it or not, because it's actually quite simple. So what I'd like you to do, you can stay right where you are is send your attention to the front of the room. You probably already are. You're looking at the slide. Just send your attention to the front of the room. <coughs> and now, without turning around, send your attention to the back of the room. Your mind made a mental map of this space the second you walked in. So just send your attention. You might even remember what's back there, what it looked like. And now bring your attention just a few inches from your nose, like you're reading a book, maybe about a foot away, as if you're reading a book. Bring your attention there. And you can relax. So very simple thing, but you are moving your attention. You're just moving it. Doesn't seem like a very big deal. We're starting to learn that that attention has an energetic charge. It's actually a thing. When you're directing attention somewhere, it's hard to measure. But there is something actually there that you are projecting, that each of us is projecting. Attention is an energy. Intention is an energy. 
And also, in the same way, what, what do all the mindfulness experiments have in common? If we look at the monk increasing his body temperature, if we look at the psoriasis patients in the light box, what did they have in common? They chose what they were focusing on. Sounds like something we would totally overlook, not a big deal. But that monk sat there and went into his practice, I'm going to raise my body temperature. That's what I'm doing. Brought his focus there, his attention. The person in the light box brought their attention to the sound of the uh, meditation and to the sensation in their arm. They directed it. So subtle, we do it a million, maybe more than a million times a day. We generally don't think of it as powerful, like there's anything there. We're learning there's a lot there. So how can consciousness create the physical world? Intention. Intention is how. And intention is attention with a purpose, with a real purpose underneath it. There's a common phrase in the healing community where attention goes, energy flows. Again, attention is energetic. And intention can be measured, manifesting as both electrostatic and magnetic energy, which is extraordinary. We're getting to a point where we're, science is getting very creative and cr creating these extraordinary technologies that can measure this kind of subtlety. Here's an example. I'm going to go into a few stu studies now. Measuring intention by observing the magnetic fields of healers. So at University of Arizona, there was found to be a huge increase in the oscillations of the magnetic field around healers' hands when they were running energy, meaning when they were consciously directing energy through their hands, compared with when they were at rest. This increase indicated that the magnetic field had been affected by a source of directed energy. And they used this, um, the way they were able to measure this was via a $4 million device called the superconducting quantum interference device. So very high tech, and a lot of money starting to go into this. Um, experienced healers averaged close to a third more magnetic changes per minute than less experienced healers. Another study, I couldn't help myself. Um, are you looking at me? It's actually, are you talking to me? But it, it looked, it worked, it worked. Uh, so non-local communication, the staring study. So we're starting to get into non-local phenomena. If matter is energy, how important is proximity anymore? How important is time anymore? The staring study. This was published in um, the British Journal of Psychology. So the receiver, there were two people in the study each time. The receiver was put in an isolated room with a video camera trained on them. The sender was in another room, isolated, with a monitor in that room. The receiver was told, hang out in this chair. We know there's a video camera on you. Just pretend it's not there. The sender would be sitting with the monitor without looking at the monitor. At random intervals, he was instructed to look at the monitor for 10 seconds and then would look away. And then very randomly, Next time, we'll do it again. The receiver was hooked up to skin conductance equipment similar to a lie detector to measure subtle fight or flight responses in the autonomic nervous system. That's another um, resource for testing these days, um, getting to those very, very subtle responses, unconscious responses. Um, at, um, what they found is that the receiver's autonomic nervous system registered a response when the person in the other room was staring at the monitor, the person was just hanging out in the room, had no idea when they were being looked at, right? It was through a monitor. Every time for a 10 second gap, the fight or flight response went up. And we all, I mean, we all have had that experience of being stared at, right? There, you feel it, there's something you feel. That's another example that this energy that you directed here, that you directed to the back of the room, has a charge, it's a thing. When it's highly emotional energy, either positive or negative, most of us feel it even more, right? Another study, this is of um, non-local healing, a double-blind study with AIDS patients. Uh, six patients or healers were asked to hold an intention for the health and well-being of a particular AIDS patient. They were sent the person's photo and medical info for an hour a day for six days. At the end of the study, the treatment group 
had six times fewer AIDS-related illnesses than the control, the, the folks who were not sent intentions, four times fewer hospitalizations, improved T-cell levels, fewer doctor's visits, fewer new illnesses, less severity of disease, and better psychological well-being. And the folks who had intentions coming their way had no idea that they were coming. It was double blind. They didn't know that, um, nobody knew if they were going to be, um, if the healers would be focusing on them. So we've been working a little bit with non-local um, energy in terms of space. Uh, now we're gonna look at time. So precognition study. Participants looked at a screen that would randomly flash either an image of a landscape or an image of violence. A violent image would trigger a fight or flight reflex in the autonomic nervous system. Again, they were hooked up to the skin um, conductance equipment. The stimulation of the ANS was monitored throughout, and when a disturbing image appeared on the screen, the ANS would register a spike, a response. Sure enough, when the violent image would come across the screen, there would be a spike in the participant's ANS activity. So the surprise. The surge of activity happened on average three seconds before the image appeared on the screen. The images were provided using a technological device called a randomizer. So nobody knows which is gonna come next, only the computer model does, even the um, folks conducting the study don't know. So there was some sort of information exchange between the phenomena of the screen change and the consciousness of the participant. And this is where it gets kind of interesting, although the consciousness was subconscious, right? The person didn't know that they knew. It was in their bodies. It was in their bodies, not up here. Um, Candace Pert, wonderful, wonderful um, researcher, passed a few years ago here at Georgetown, did a lot of work on the mind and emotions, um, called the body our subconscious mind. The body is our subconscious mind. There's more and more evidence that that um, could be true. So by what mechanism could this happen? Could it be the heart? Little known facts about your heart. Your heart's magnetic field radiates outward and carries information that can affect other people and animals around you. The rhythms in the Earth's magnetic fields have the same frequencies as human and animal cardiovascular systems and brains. People's heart rhythms, something called heart rate variability, can synchronize with each other over a 30-day period. So which is more influential, the heart or the head? The heart generates the largest electromagnetic field in the body. It's pretty extraordinary. The electric field as measured in an ECG, is about 60 times greater in amplitude, you all know those devices, right, that have the, the waves, in amplitude than brain waves recorded by an EEG. The magnetic component of the heart's field, which is around 100 times stronger than that produced by the brain, can be measured several feet away from the body. Several feet away from the body. Exactly, you might turn to see who you're next to and who's behind <laughs> you and in front of you. Um, so the, the heart's magnetic um, field actually projects from us, right? So, you know, the question of the moment, really, um, the Kaplan Center does such extraordinary healing work with so many people, and so much of what we focus on there has to do with the power of our beliefs and um, the effect of our mind and our health and our heart on our physical well-being.